Johnny Football got his first real playing time of the season this past week and even ran for a touchdown on his first drive. Should he be owned in all fantasy leagues or should we be waiting for him to be officially announced as the starter? And the Saints got a huge win, but what happened to Jimmy Graham? Should fantasy owners be concerned about their stud tight end? I'll give you the latest injury updates on Andre Ellington, Julius Thomas, Jamal Charles, Alshon Jeffrey, Rashad Jennings, and Roddy White. I'll also give you my top players that you should be adding off of waivers for your playoff run. It's all on today's episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast. I am your host, Nick, also known as Clickwid, and I'm here every week, twice a week, to answer your questions and give you the advice that you need to win your fantasy football leagues. Let's get things started today with the big news. Everybody's talking about it. Johnny Manziel got his first playing time. Well, not technically his first playing time because he's gotten a few snaps here and there as just kind of a gimmick, but his first real playing time this past week. He, he and the Browns did lose to the Buffalo Bills, but you know what? You look at it, and they scored on the first drive that Manziel was on the field. He gave them kind of a spark that they really haven't had over the past couple of weeks under Brian Hoyer. I don't know whether it's that Brian Hoyer is finally getting figured out by defenses or if he's losing confidence or exactly what the deal is, but they're certainly not performing like they did earlier in the year. And it just seemed like when Manziel was on the field that there was like a different energy in on the team. I don't know I don't know exactly what it was, but you know, we've seen this before with players like Tim Tebow and even, you know, in situations like when Mike Vick came on the field a couple of years ago for the Philadelphia Eagles. There was just an interesting like dynamic that grew because of it. And I think that you can kind of see that developing with the Cleveland Browns offense under Johnny Manziel. Um, like I mentioned, he did rush for a touchdown on his first drive. He did miss a snap later in the game, which resulted in a Bills recovery for a touchdown. So that wasn't the best. But we kind of look at this situation like this. The coaching staff is in a really tough situation right now because Johnny Manziel is obviously the fan favorite. He's the guy who's going to put butts in the seats. He's the guy who's going to sell merchandise. But Brian Hoyer's put that team into playoff contention for the first time in, I don't know how long. It's been quite a while since the Browns have actually been contending for a division title. I mean, I don't think that they've, this deep in the season, I can't remember them competing for a division title. It's been that long. So the fact that they're still in it and really have a chance to potentially win their division down the stretch here, I don't know, can you really bench Brian Hoyer at this point in time? I mean, I understand that he hasn't been great over the past couple of weeks, but do we sit a guy after just that short of a time of him not performing well? I don't know. It's tough to say, but fantasy owners in 12-team leagues, we're kind of looking at Johnny Manziel as a guy who you could potentially add, but I think you can kind of afford to keep him on the waiver wire. And the reason that I say that is because the Browns offense isn't that great to begin with. I don't see them out there scoring 30 points a week. Manziel could still be also prone to some turnovers this early in his career. I mean, I understand that he does bring an exciting element with his running, and, and he's probably a borderline fantasy starter if he does get the job because he has the rushing ability, but we just can't really tell at this point whether or not he has control of the offense, whether the other guys are going to perform and click well with him. It's just hard to say, but I will tell you this. I do think that ultimately Johnny Manziel will be given the starting job by the end of the season. Whether it happens this week, I don't know. The Browns play the Indianapolis Colts this week at home, which is kind of an interesting scenario because if they were on the road, I think that you would see Brian Hoyer out there for sure. But the fact that they're going to be at home really makes me think that they might go to Manziel this week just because of the fanfare. You know, they want to get the fans hyped up. They want the fans to be involved in this game greatly because the Colts are a big time matchup. Indianapolis is one of the teams that's competing for a first round bye this year. Doubt they're going to get it because you've got New England and Denver in the same conference. But, I mean, really, they could potentially be one of the teams that gets that first round by. They're, they're definitely one of the top five or six teams in the league right now, I would say. So, you know, it's going to be difficult for them to keep up in this game. And if they do fall behind, 
I do think that there's a good chance that you start to see the fans start chanting for Johnny, Johnny, Johnny. And if that happens, it's going to be very difficult for the coaches to keep him off the field. And I do think that he will have some sort of playing time this week, whether or not it's with the start or not. So fantasy-wise, I'm probably not starting Johnny Manziel in any league this this week unless, you know, he's given the starting job on Wednesday, which is supposed to be when he is announced as the starter or not. You know, they're supposed to make that decision on Wednesday, but you you really can't trust him at this point in my opinion unless you're in a 2QB league just because we just don't know what he's going to have. I mean, unless you're in a situation where you've got, you know, like an Alex Smith as your starter in a, in a 12 or a 14 team league, I'm not starting Johnny Manziel over hardly anybody. So hopefully that helps you out, guys. The other guy that is an, an interesting scenario right now, Jimmy Graham. Is his face like on some melt cartons right now or something? Because this dude was completely missing this past week. Has anybody seen Jimmy Graham? I mean, anybody? He didn't catch a single pass. He wasn't even targeted in the win over the Steelers. Now, the Steelers were definitely shading coverages toward Graham, and I I watched this game again today uh, on the NFL replay, so I did see every play, well, essentially every play anyway. They they chop out some of the irrelevant ones, but they were really shading a lot of coverage toward Jimmy Graham is what it looked like to me, so that left a couple other players wide open for big gains and touchdowns. I know Kenny Stills had a couple of touchdowns, and um, or at least one touchdown. I don't remember if he ended up scoring two or what, but um, yeah, he, he definitely uh, oh yeah, Kenny Stills did score two touchdowns now that I think about it. So um, yeah, so he definitely had got open. Ben Watson was wide open for a touchdown. I mean, the fact that defenses are really focusing in on Jimmy Graham, they can take away Jimmy Graham. I mean, it's not that this guy is completely undefendable. If you start putting two, three guys in his direction, it's going to be tough for Drew Brees to not throw it to other guys because they're going to be wide open. And that's really what I think we saw mostly this past week. It is still a little bit surprising that he wasn't targeted even once, but the fact is is that he's still the number two overall scoring tight end, quite a bit behind Rob Gronkowski at this point, still a little bit ahead of Julius Thomas, but honestly, Jimmy Graham has not been this season what we expected coming into the season. I had Jimmy Graham as I think he was either my number five or my number six overall player coming into the year, but I had him ranked ahead of where most people had him ranked. And the reason for it is not because I didn't think that there were other good tight ends, but because I looked at it like he's probably the most likely guy to give me elite production. Obviously Gronkowski, if he's healthy, we we really love that. And he's been healthy all year or the vast majority of the year anyway. So he's been producing huge numbers, obviously. But Jimmy Graham and Rob Gronkowski are really your two main guys with Julius Thomas kind of trailing behind. But Jimmy Graham has not produced the type of consistent production that we've expected from an elite guy that we take in the first round. And that's a little bit disappointing, especially when you consider the fact that on the season right now in in non-PPR leagues, Jimmy Graham only has 10 more points on the year than than guys like Greg Olson. Not to say that Greg Olson's been bad. Greg Olson's been a good fantasy tight end this year, but you get Greg Olson way later in drafts. And if you consider that he's only giving you less than one point more than Greg Olson per week, it's really not worth it to take him in the first round when you can get Greg Olson six, seven, eighth round, you know? And then you look at guys like Kobe Fleener, who've really kind of been the backup tight end in Indianapolis, but over the past couple of weeks, he's really produced big numbers, and now he's only 23 points below Jimmy Graham in your standard scoring leagues. So again, that's about a two-point-per-week difference. Now, I understand two points can be the difference between a win or a loss, but given the fact that Jimmy Graham was a first-round pick and Kobe Fleener was undrafted in most leagues, you can see kind of where the discrepancy is here. You can understand why Frankly, Colby Fleener is the better fantasy value at the tight end position, and that's pretty disappointing. But what I will say is that Jimmy Graham is a big-time playmaker. I would not be shocked if the Saints look to him many, many times over the next couple of weeks here. Uh, He has a good matchup here in Week 14 against the Panthers. This is a must-win game for the Saints to stay even in close to potential potentially making the playoffs so they have to get this w in their division and jimmy graham had seven catches for 83 yards and a touchdown when these teams played in week nine he's obviously a good bet to score every week i understand he had a poor week this past week but we do not bench our guys like jimmy graham 
He's just too big of a stud. He's too much of a potential to have a monster game. There just aren't many other tight ends that have that potential. So he has to be in your lineup basically over everybody not named Rob Gronkowski. So hopefully that helps you out. Don't worry too much about Jimmy Graham. He still should be producing great numbers going forward. So now let's talk about some of the waiver wire players that I think you need to be out there and adding this week. Obviously, you know, we're toward the end of the season and we've been talking about this for a couple of weeks now that, you know, we just don't really find the type of high quality talent at this point in the season that we did earlier in the year when we were able to add guys who became starting running backs and things like that. But there are still values out there. And there are still guys that can give you the fantasy production that you need to compete in your fantasy playoffs, especially at least at your flex position. So we're going to start things off here with a guy who has kind of won the starting job in Indianapolis, and that is Dan Boom Heron, running back. 27 touches, 192 yards, and a touchdown over his past two games. Good production, not great production, but when you compare him to Trent Richardson, who has only six fewer carries over the past two games, and he has 130 fewer yards almost, I mean, yeah, there's definitely a major difference here. And, you know, you look at a guy like Trent Richardson, and there just isn't a whole lot to be excited about at this point. The guy hasn't produced numbers in almost two full seasons now in Indianapolis or and, and in Cleveland as well. So you look at it like that, and it's just it's way too difficult for us to trust Trent Richardson at all anymore. And I think the Colts are kind of going in this new direction with Dan Heron. I don't expect necessarily that he's going to keep the job into 2015. I wouldn't be surprised if Ahmad Bradshaw is back and maybe producing, you know, solid enough numbers that he can keep that starting job there. But for the remainder of 2014, I think Dan Heron is going to be the guy there in that high-paced Indianapolis offense. They put up a lot of points. Andrew Luck's having a monster year. He'll throw to his running backs as well, and Dan Heron's done pretty well in that category. So there's not really a lot to dislike about Dan Heron. But given the fact that Trent Richardson still is getting a decent number of touches here, despite the fact that he's completely ineffective with them, he's getting about three yards per touch at this point, but he's still getting enough that's keeping Dan Heron from really breaking out into being a solid, you know, low-end RB1, high-end RB2. I still think that Dan Heron's a guy that you can start as a low-end RB2 or a flex, but... Given the fact that he's not getting the ball 20 to 25 times a game like other starting running backs do, it's tough to really trust him every single week. But he is owned in 41% of leagues right now, which means that he's still out there in almost 60% of leagues. Definitely needs to be owned in all leagues right now. Even down to your eight-team leagues, I still think that he's potentially good enough and uh, he should be able to give you good fantasy numbers for the remainder of the season. Number two on my list this week is actually a tight end, and it's somebody that I was pretty high on coming into the season, Jordan Reed of the Washington Redskins. Now, obviously, he's had his concerns with injuries and things like that, but the fact is is that he's produced great numbers with Colt McCoy at quarterback. Nine catches for 123 yards this past week against the Colts. He actually caught seven passes when Colt McCoy started against the Cowboys as well. So he's obviously a major safety valve for McCoy. McCoy feels very comfortable throwing to him. And the tight end position is so thin this year that finding a player with the upside that Jordan Reed brings is very, very difficult. So I'm definitely looking at Jordan Reed as somebody that I'm adding in a lot of leagues right now, unless I'm with, you know, the Julius Thomases, the Jimmy Graham. Rams, the Rob Gronkowski's, Greg Olson, you know, that level of guy. Unless I'm there, I'm probably looking at Jordan Reed. I think he's a top eight tight end as long as he's healthy through the remainder of the season. And that's something that's hard to find at this point in the year. So I would definitely go out there and acquire Jordan Reed. He's only owned right now in 25% of leagues. So he should certainly be picked up in a lot of leagues this week. Next on the list, number three, we have Kenny Stills, wide receiver for the New Orleans Saints. He's only owned in 18% of leagues, 17 catches for 292 yards and two touchdowns over his past three games. He's now the highest scoring New Orleans wide receiver this season. Brandon Cooks is now on the IR, so he should get even more playing time going forward. I definitely think that Kenny Stills is somebody who could produce good numbers, could give you those big weeks, and he also could give you the weeks where he gets you, you know, two catches for 18 yards or something like that. So 
it's kind of a boomer bust type of proposition here with Kenny Stills. I don't see him getting eight catches a game or anything like that. But, you know, with the catches that he gets, there aren't a whole lot of guys that go deeper better than Kenny Stills. So other than like your Deshaun Jacksons or those kind of guys that that really blow the top off the defense on a regular basis, Kenny Stills is one of the best deep threats in the game today. So, you know, the, the boomer bust potential really does make him a potential flex option for you in fantasy going down the stretch. Next on the list, Devontae Adams, wide receiver for the Green Bay Packers. He is only owned in 7% of leagues, six catches for 121 yards in week 13. Previously, though, he hadn't caught more than two passes since all the way back in week eight, so it's hard to really trust Devontae Adams, but given the fact that he was produced, he produced such good numbers the past in the past week, um, I like him. I'm not as high on him as I am Kenny Stills or, you know, uh, the other guys that are ranked above him, but I think that if you're in a 12-team league, a 14-team league, you could consider going out there and adding Devontae Adams this week, just given the fact the Packers are so good offensively that, you know, finding three mouths to feed in that offense, that passing game, it's not that difficult. I think that they're kind of at the same level as the Broncos have been where, you know, there's definitely an option for three, four guys even potentially to have solid fantasy production in those offenses. Next, we have Johnny Football. We talked a little bit about him before. He's only owned in 3% of leagues right now, and obviously we don't know if he's going to be the starter going forward. But like I had mentioned, I think that he does have low-end QB1 potential because of his mobility. Josh Gordon, of course, helps as well. I'm not huge on him. I don't think that he's somebody you have to add right now. But given the fact that, like I had mentioned, he is a low-end QB1 if he does get the starting job or you know potentially a high-end QB2, I think you could own him. I would definitely own him over the likes of, you know, a Derek Carr or an Alex Smith or, you know, guys like that who aren't necessarily producing the type of consistent numbers that you would look for in a fantasy quarterback. I think Manziel has a higher bust or a boom potential than them. He does have also have a higher bust potential though. So, you know, it's it's kind of it's kind of tough, but you know, if you're if you somehow made the fantasy playoffs and for some reason maybe you lost Nick Foles a couple of weeks ago and you start off really hot, and you've maybe just kind of tinkered off since then, and you haven't been able to find a quality quarterback to go with, I think Manziel is somebody you could add in that type of a scenario, but I certainly wouldn't be benching a guy like, you know, an Aaron Rodgers, and Andrew Luck, a Drew Brees, um, even down to, like, um, you know, a Tony Romo. I think I would still play above Johnny Manziel most weeks. I kind of think... Matt Stafford is somebody I would still play above him as well. So, I mean, that that kind of should give you an idea anyway of where I'm thinking about Johnny Manziel as far as relative value is going forward. I don't necessarily think you have to add him, but he could be somebody that could give you some decent value down the stretch here if you need help at the quarterback position. If you're in a two-quarterback league, he is a must-add right now. Last player on the waiver wire ads list, and this is somebody that we've been kind of sneakily thinking about over the past couple of weeks. He's only owned in 2% of leagues, but that's Dante Moncrief of the Indianapolis Colts. Three catches for 134 yards and two touchdowns against the Redskins this past week. He's definitely taken Hakeem Nix's role as the wide receiver three in Indianapolis behind T.Y. T. Hilton and um, uh, Reggie Wayne. Excuse me, I almost said Roddy White. Same same initials, wrong guy. Same veteran type of, of player as well. But uh, yeah, so Hakeem Nix, definitely somebody who is droppable in fantasy if for whatever reason he's owned. Moncrief is the guy that you want. Andrew Luck spreads the ball around a lot, which can make it kind of frustrating to own any of these receivers. Even T.Y. Hilton's had a couple of down weeks. But Moncrief has some decent potential. I really think he does. Uh, We look at just the physical abilities of the guys, and there aren't a whole lot of rookie receivers out there that have better potential than Moncrief. I think that he should definitely be owned in all dynasty leagues at this point as somebody that you can hold and keep going down the stretch. Reggie Wayne could end up retiring after the season. We've heard kind of rumors of that, and the production just has kind of tailed off toward the end of the season this year and it was kind of not so great last year as well so it wouldn't be all that surprising to see Reggie Wayne call it a career he's been a you know a potential borderline hall of fame type of producer over the course of his career he's won a Super Bowl there's not a whole lot else for Reggie Wayne to do at this point other than hold on and um, you know produce solid numbers but not really anything that's super fantasy relevant 
And I think if Reggie Wayne does end up retiring, Moncrief and T.Y. Hilton going forward is a pretty formidable duo at wide receiver, especially if you've got the the tight ends, Dwayne Allen and Colby Fleener producing solid numbers. And we talked a little bit about Boom Heron and if Ahmad Bradshaw is back next year, if he's healthy and can, can uh, you know, get close to what he produced this year. If they get rid of Trent Richardson, great, <laughs> you know, because at that point, then there's an, uh, even a, another less mouth to feed. But even if Reggie Wayne does stay in Indianapolis, he plays next season, I wouldn't be surprised if Moncrief continues to see more and more time on the field. So, you know, go out there and pick him up in your dynasty leagues for sure. You could pick him up in your standard leagues right now as kind of a flyer toward the end of the year and see if he continues to produce good numbers over the next week or two. But given the fact that you are probably in your fantasy playoffs this week, maybe next week at the latest, um, you probably do are okay at wide receiver would be my guess enough that you don't need to be starting a Moncrief, but it's still worth, I think, adding him at this point in a lot of leagues, just given the fact that there aren't a whole lot of guys out there that are going to give you better fantasy numbers than Moncrief um, as far as waiver wire acquisitions go. So if you're out there and you, for whatever reason, had a Justin Hunter who's now on the IR uh, with that lacerated spleen, I think Moncrief's somebody that you could go out there and pick up at least as, as a guy to potentially replace him. But I still, like I had mentioned, I like him less than I like a Kenny Stills and less than I like Devontae Adams at wide receiver. So he is third on this list and the last guy that I'm going to talk about today. Now, I want to talk a little bit about some of these injuries. We I, I did quickly touch there on Justin Hunter. Uh, he is going to be out for the remainder of the season. That's probably the biggest major injury that we've seen all, uh, over this past week, although not that Justin Hunter was super fantasy relevant himself. We had a lot of expectations about him coming into the season, but he has not lived up to those. But there are still a bunch of injuries that we can touch on. I'm really only going to touch on the ones that I think have the biggest fantasy implications for the remainder of the season and specifically here in week 14. So I'm going to start things off with the biggest one, in my opinion, which is Andre Ellington. Now, obviously, he has been dealing with some lower leg injuries all year. They've kind of been lingering on and on all year. But this past week, it was a hip pointer that knocked him out against the Falcons. Now, they did say that this is not as serious as it looked at first. First, but reports are that he could still miss a week or two here, which is certainly a killer in fantasy leagues because these are the weeks when we definitely need him. So it, it sucks, but the truth is, is that Andre Ellington's been terrible over his past four games. 101 total rushing yards during that stretch. Now, he does have 82 total yards receiving during those games, but even then, that's nothing special. That's Even if you add those two together, that's less than 50 yards a game on average that he's getting over the past four games. I tried to tell everybody a few weeks ago that Ellington was the number one guy that I was trying to look to trade away before the trade deadline just because of his schedule. He has so many brutal matchups coming up, so I hope you guys took my advice on that. But he's got the Chiefs, Rams, Seahawks, and 49ers coming up. None of those defenses are good for run def or for uh, run stopping or excuse me, none of them are good to run against. I should say so. You know, Ellington, even if he does come back and play, this is just not a great scenario. Marion Grice appears to be the quote unquote next man up. That's kind of the the mantra that the that the uh, Arizona Cardinals have had this season. So, you know. If you need somebody, I think Marion Grice is somebody that you could go out there and pick up as kind of a flyer and especially as a handcuff right now for Andre Ellington. But he only had 40 yards in the loss to the Falcons, and he doesn't appear to be anywhere near the explosive player that Andre Ellington is. So, I mean, if you pick up Marion Grice, maybe you get five to six points out of him in these type of matchups here against the Chiefs and the Rams. I'm not expecting him to be a big-time fantasy producer, but he is somebody, if Ellington's out, who will get touches at least, and that's something that you can't overlook, obviously, at, in fantasy. There aren't a whole lot of guys that you can go out there and pick up right now that are going to get you better numbers than that if if they're on your waiver wire. So um, he's kind of the final guy that I would say as far as, uh, as far as waiver wire acquisitions potentially go, but I would really only pick him up right now if Andre Ellington is ruled out, and we'll probably know a little bit more about about that as the week goes on. So be it paying attention to the practices in Arizona if you're an Andre Ellington owner, or even if you're going up against Andre Ellington's owner, uh, you might want to go out there and pick up Marion Grice as kind of a block so that your, your opponent doesn't have a starting running back this week, potentially. Next guy on the list, Rashad Jennings. 
who will be up against the Tennessee Titans here in Week 14 if he plays. But we have much better news about Rashad Jennings than we do Andre Ellington. He was knocked out of Sunday's loss to the Jaguars, and at that time, he was saying that he couldn't put any weight on his ankle, which sounds awful. He had an injury that kept him out for a few weeks earlier this season, but he is saying that he's much better now. So we do expect that he will play this week, and it is an excellent matchup against the Titans. They have an awful defense. They're absolutely getting murdered by everybody right now. Uh, You know, defensively, they can't stop anybody. They can't stop a common cold. So, um, you know, Rashad Jennings, I would definitely say if he's out there, um, if he's able to play this week, he needs to be in your lineup. The, the Giants just aren't going to take the chance that he could potentially get hurt if uh, if he's not going to be healthy, if he's not close to 100%. I don't expect to see him out there. So if he is out there in the lineup, he needs to be in your fantasy lineup as well. This is just too good of a matchup, and Jennings is too good of a player. Next, we have another guy who has had some injury problems so far this season, and that is Jamal Charles. Obviously, he has been a just a ridiculous monster in fantasy, just like he was last year, just like he has been through most of his career, frankly. Uh, but he did bruise his knee in Week 13 in the loss to the Broncos. Now, a bruise doesn't sound so bad, but these are the kind of injuries that really hurt a player like Jamal Charles who thrives on his explosiveness because... Even if he ends up playing through it, if he's not at 100%, he's not Jamal Charles. Do you get what I'm saying here? I mean, there are other guys who have the type of playing style, like maybe, um, you know, like a LeGarrette Blunt, let's say. If if he had a, a bruised knee or something like that, okay, so yeah, he's in pain or whatever, but he doesn't thrive on his speed and his elusiveness and things like that. So if there's discomfort in his knee for some reason, he's pretty much just going to run the same that he currently does. He's going to lower his shoulder and run a guy over. And uh, unlike Jamal Charles, who uses his knees to cut and and things like that, so it, it really affects him differently than it does other running backs. And this matchup this week at Arizona is a very difficult one. Arizona is third in the league in fantasy points per game allowed to the running back position. They've only allowed one team to rush for over 100 yards against them all season. So that should tell you how good Arizona is against the run. Obviously, if Jamal Charles plays, he has to be in your lineup. He's just too good not to be. But if he's unable to play, I think Niall Davis is potentially somebody who should be in your lineup this week, even in a tough matchup. We saw earlier this year that Davis could be an RB1 if given the opportunity. So if he's available in your league, I would absolutely be out there getting Niall Davis immediately. And especially if you own Jamal Charles, you need to handcuff him to Jamal Charles because... um, We talked about this before, but there are a lot of guys on fantasy rosters right now who are not ever going to start for you for the remainder of the year. Maybe it's your backup quarterback or something like that. You have have Peyton Manning, and then you have a Colin Kaepernick, or... Maybe you have like a Jamal Charles and you've got a, a DeMarco Murray as your as your other running back. You got him in the second round. And look, there aren't other running backs that are going to start over those guys if they're healthy. So why do you have, you know, a guy like a Darren McFadden owned in your league? Or, you know, why are you rostering somebody like even the guys that we talked about, a Dan Heron or something like that? He doesn't have the same value that Anil Davis does if Jamal Charles goes out. So that's why I think it's so important, even if you perceive that a Boom Heron or, you know, a guy like that is a Denard Robinson or somebody like that might score more points than Niall Davis down the stretch. You know, if if they're both healthy, he's probably going to. It would be very difficult for him not to, frankly. But the truth is, is that if Niall Davis is the guy and he gets the start in a game, he has a higher upside than a guy like a Dan Heron does. So I would definitely go out there and get your Niall Davis this week. Make sure that he is is owned in your league right now. If uh, Even if you don't own Jamal Charles, I still think that he's somebody that you should go out there and acquire. I think that he has low-end RB1 potential if he's healthy. And if this knee injury does affect Jamal Charles for longer than one week, he could give you some really nice games down the stretch. So definitely go out there and pick him up. But like I mentioned, we probably are going to see Jamal Charles on the field this week. And if he's out there, he certainly needs to be in your lineup. Next guy, Julius Thomas, tight end for the Denver Broncos. Obviously, we have seen him have monster games when he's been healthy. But he has been killing 
fantasy owners over the past couple of weeks. He's been a game time decision in each of the past two Broncos games. And I tried to tell everybody this past week to look elsewhere at the tight end position, unless you were in an absolutely desperate situation where you had to score huge points. And then you take the chance that he's going to play, but he didn't. So you have to be out there getting somebody else right now at the tight end position. We don't exactly know when he is going to be back. Reports are that he should play this week against the Bills. Everything that we've heard seems to be that he is healthier this week than he has been in the past couple of weeks, which is good. No major setbacks. But the Broncos will certainly need him this week. The Bills lead the league in sacks right now. And having a Julius Thomas available as a safety valve would be huge for Peyton Manning and the Denver offense. So if he's healthy, just like Jamal Charles, he needs to be in your lineup. Even if there's a concern that he might end up being re-injured or even if he's on, you know, a snap count or something like that, like they always talk about, those snap counts are such BS. Like if the guy's healthy, if he looks good when he's out there, they're going to leave their studs on the field just like Josh Gordon was a couple of weeks ago. They claimed he was going to get like 20, 20, 25 snaps. He ended up being out there for like 80% of the team's snaps. So uh, that's BS. I wouldn't lead in, read into that at all. Um, Julius Thomas, to me, is just like I talked about with Jimmy Graham. If he's healthy, he has to be in your lineup at the tight end position just because there's like practically nobody else out there other than Rob Gronkowski who gives you the high-end potential that Thomas does. He's the number three overall scoring tight end in your standard scoring leagues, and he would be even higher if he didn't miss the past two games, and really, frankly, pretty much three games because of an injury. He could be right now the number one tight end if he were healthy all year. So, I mean, that's the kind of potential that you have in a Julius Thomas. Obviously, he needs to be in your lineup. If he's not out there again this week, obviously, you have to look elsewhere. I would be looking at Jordan Reed if he's available, like I talked about. Kobe Fleener also is still available in way too many leagues right now. I don't know what the deal is with that. Make sure you're out there picking up Kobe Fleener if he is potentially available. He's putting up ridiculous numbers for the Colts right now, and he seems to be kind of back in that stride that he was with with Andrew Luck when the two of them were in college. So uh, certainly Kobe Fleener needs to be owned in just about every single league as well. If you're a Julius Thomas owner, I would be looking for a handcuff type tight end for your Julius Thomas just in case he doesn't play this week. Next, we have Roddy White, who missed this past Sunday's game against the Cardinals with an ankle injury. Now, head coach Mike Smith did say that he expects White to return this week against the Packers, but they are going to be in Green Bay. And cold weather makes things tough on an ankle. So just like we saw this past week, he will not play unless he is really ready to go. So, uh, you know, if if we're out there and it looks like he's might, maybe going to play, if he, if he ends up being on the active roster, if he's out there and suited up for game time, he probably needs to be in your lineup. The Packers defense has been playing pretty well recently, but still, I mean, Roddy White was just putting up huge numbers the past couple of weeks before he got injured. So fantasy owners will definitely be hoping to have him back for this game. This is a huge game for the Falcons. They have to win if they want to even be remotely close to playoff potential at this point. Last, as far as injuries go today, Alshon Jeffrey. This is the big one for Thursday Night Football. That's a big question mark at this point. A hamstring injury caused him to miss practice on Tuesday, and that was after being limited in practice on Monday. So it's never a good sign that we see a guy get downgraded on Tuesday from where he was at on a Monday. He practiced on Monday, a little bit at least, and then didn't practice on Tuesday. Now, Mark Tressman did say that he was held out of practice on Tuesday due to precautionary reasons. He didn't re-injure anything, but still, it's it's going to be a game-time decision, I think, on Thursday. We w- I wish that this game wasn't on Thursday because then we'd have a better solidification on him probably playing. I think that, you know, if if Mark Tressman's saying that it's just precautionary that he was held out on Tuesday, then, you know, he'd still have five days to kind of get healthy before Sunday. But now he misses practice on Tuesday and he didn't really practice much on Monday. So he's going to practice on Wednesday and that's it. Even if he does practice on Wednesday, that's one day of practice for an entire week. That's not good. That is not good. I definitely don't like to see that. We certainly will have to pay close attention to what happens on Wednesday to see if he practices. But we are currently thinking that he should be able to play against Dallas on Thursday. 
Unfortunately, as Chicago has kind of been this season, guys that are listed as being active sometimes don't get the type of playing time or they they just don't look like themselves. And we've seen that with Alshon Jeffrey and Brandon Marshall this year. They've been active and not produced big numbers. So we need to pay close attention, like I said, to what happens in practice on Wednesday. If he looks good in practice, I have no problem with you putting him into your fantasy lineup on Thursday. Dallas's defense has not been doing very well, especially against the pass over the couple, past couple of weeks. So, uh, yeah, Alshon could potentially put up huge numbers this week. He has definitely been Jay Cutler's favorite target over the past couple of weeks. And I'm just not too worried about him if he is healthy. I would certainly have him in my lineup this week. All right, so we went over all the injuries. We've talked a little bit about some of the players who could potentially be added to your fantasy football team off of waivers. We talked about Jimmy Graham and Johnny Manziel, but now I want to finish things up today by answering some of your questions from YouTube and Twitter. As always, guys, if you have any questions for me, I would be gl- just greatly appreciated if you guys would leave them in the comments section below or tweet them to me at Clickwood TV because I love to answer them. Even if I don't end up answering them on the show, I typically am going to respond to you in the comments section or tweet back at you. So uh, definitely send those my way and I will give you my advice as far as what I think you should do for your lineup for each week. All right, first question comes from D Dwayne seventeen eight ninety nine on YouTube, and he wants to know something about Denard Robinson. We talked a little bit about Denard Robinson in regards to a question that he asked, I think, two weeks ago, and I at, I told him that I would play Denard Robinson at that time. In hindsight, probably not the right decision. Denard Robinson has not been producing at all, really. He's getting you know four to five, six points in your PPR leagues, but he's asking me if he should drop Denard Robinson right now. And of course, my answer to that question is always depends on who's available. So he actually did let me know that there are two players that he could potentially add for Denard Robinson. The first one is Trey Mason. And I will tell you this much, St. Louis is running the football pretty effectively right now, and Trey Mason is benefiting. He is certainly prospering right now, and he put up huge numbers this past week. Trey Mason is, I don't think that he's like some super spectacular, talented running back or anything, but if he's given the opportunity and he gets 20 carries a week, he's going to produce solid numbers. So I would certainly drop Denard Robinson for Trey Mason right now. There's probably a lot of running backs that I would drop for Trey Mason right now. I have Trey Mason probably around my like 15th ranked running back for the remainder of the season. So I think that he's a very solid RB2 going forward. And Denard Robinson is certainly below him right now on that list. The Rams still face the Redskins and the Giants down the stretch in games that I think Denard, or uh, excuse me, Trey Mason should be able to do well in. So yeah, I would definitely drop him uh, for, I would definitely drop Denard Robinson for Trey Mason. Now, we talked a little bit about Dan Heron before, and I certainly think, obviously, Heron is in a better offense, and even though he's splitting touches with Richardson, I still think it's more likely that he gets into the end zone than Robinson, given the fact that the Colts just score so many more points than the Jaguars do. So I, I wouldn't necessarily recommend that people go out there to drop Denard Robinson and just race to their waiver wire to pick up random guys, but I would drop Denard Robinson for either Dan Heron or Trey Mason at this point, Trey Mason being first and Dan Heron being second on that list. If you can hold on to him, I do think that Denard Robinson has a solid week 16 matchup against the Titans, and that's really about as good as it's going to get for him, but he does have a couple of other tough matchups down the stretch that you probably don't want to play him in. So if you're looking to find somebody else that you need to put into your lineup for the next couple of weeks, yeah, Trey Mason first and Dan Heron second. All right, next question from Sam Legg on YouTube, and he asks, should I trade Des Bryant and Keenan Allen for CJ Anderson and Alshon Jeffrey? Well, okay, here's the deal. First of all, you still have trades going on in your league? That that blows my mind. I, I thought most leagues would have passed their trade deadline by now. I, I kept doing trade questions on the show just because I know that some leagues have different trade deadlines than others. ESPN, I think, is a different week than Yahoo, and I think they're both different than NFL.com, if I remember correctly. But even if you if, – so what we're just going to say is that, yeah, okay, so trades are still going on in your league. That's great. We'll talk about it, um, and, and for the rest of you – this. 
this isn't going to help you as far as the, the actual trading goes of this, but you'll probably get an idea of where I'm thinking about these players as far as their relative value is going forward. So again, the, the question is, should I trade Des Bryant and Keenan Allen for CJ Anderson and Alshon Jeffrey? And the reality is, is that I need to know more about your specific team because it really depends on your roster needs. If you need a running back, then yes, absolutely, you need to do this trade. I think CJ Anderson is a top 10 running back for the remainder of the season. I do think he is going to end up holding on to this job in Denver and at least being the guy who gets the vast majority of the touches for them, even when Monty Ball and Ronnie Hillman go come back. So he hasn't done anything at all to not give them confidence in him. He's giving giving them huge numbers. Fantasy owners are riding CJ Anderson all the way to a championship at this point. And to be honest with you, the drop-off between Des Bryant to Alshon Jeffrey isn't that significant. So my opinion is you're essentially trading, you know, Des Bryant, who is probably a top five, six receiver for Alshon Jeffrey, who presuming he's healthy, is probably a top 10 to 11, 12 receiver or so. So, you know, you're losing about six spots of value or so. But the drop-off between C.J. Anderson to Keenan Allen is huge. I know they're not the same position, but Keenan Allen's relative value, he's probably, you know, 18th to 20th, somewhere in that range at wide receiver, maybe, maybe even deeper than that because he's been so inconsistent. And CJ Anderson, like I said, in, in my opinion, is a top 10 fantasy back for the remainder of the year. So if you need that running back, I would definitely do it. If you don't really need the running back, if you've got solid running backs, then I wouldn't do this trade because I think Des Bryant, like I said, is better than Alshon Jeffrey. And if you need the wide receiver, then you're probably going to need to have Keenan Allen out there as well. So, you know, it, it kind of depends on what the rest of your roster looks like. In a bubble, I'm probably doing this trade if, you know, if I don't know anything about the rest of your roster, given the fact that, you know, like I had mentioned, I don't think there's as big of a drop-off from Dez to Alshon as there is from CJ to uh, Keenan Allen. So hopefully that helps you out a little bit. Good luck on that trade. I would, uh, I would probably do it, like I said, unless you need two wide receivers. All right, next question. This comes from nparrot17 on Twitter, and this is kind of a longer one. I'm going to go into this in depth a little bit more because he has some elite receivers here, and he needs to sit one of them. So the guys that he has this week are Jordy Nelson, who is up against the Atlanta Falcons at home, Odell Beckham, who is going to be at Tennessee, Des Bryant, who's at Chicago, and Josh Gordon, who is against the Colts at home. So first one, Jordy Nelson, I think, is a must-start every single week. Atlanta has given up over 175 yards to wide receivers in all but two games this season. They're giving up huge numbers to the wide receiver position, and Jordy Nelson is the number one wide receiver in arguably the best offense in the league right now. Aaron Rodgers is red hot, and I know he spreads the ball out a lot. He spread it out a lot this past week specifically, which caused Jordy Nelson to have a lower than usual production in his fantasy value, but he did still, still score a touchdown, so there's not a whole lot to be worried about. Jordy Nelson is an elite receiver, a top five fantasy wide receiver. He absolutely needs to be in your lineup every single week, regardless of matchup, and especially in a great matchup like this at home against the Falcons. So yes, on Jordy Nelson, he needs to be in there. Next guy, Odell Beckham. I am going to keep him in my lineup this week if I'm you. He got held out of the end zone this past week against the Jaguars, which I think was a little bit surprising for people, but he still did have 90 yards receiving. He's caught at least six passes and had 90 or more yards in five straight games right now. So in your PPR leagues, that's 15 or more points at minimum in each of his past five games. Big, big production for him. Obviously, he's had a couple of games where he's broken out for big numbers as well. The Titans gave up 323 yards and three touchdowns to the Texans wide receivers this past week. Six total passing touchdowns given up to Ryan Fitzpatrick. They're arguably the worst secondary in the NFL right now, and I understand Eli Manning has not looked great, but Odell Beckham is going to eat them alive in this game. He is definitely somebody that I'm putting in my lineup this week. Big, big production out of him, I think, and he's just given you consistent production since he's been out there on the field, so yeah, I have no concerns about Odell Beckham giving me good numbers. Next, we have Des Bryant who is up against the Chicago Bears on Thursday Night Football. Obviously, this one's in Chicago, so it's going to be cold weather. But I'm not too worried about Dez. 
I understand he had a, a slow week this past week. He only caught four passes. He did get 73 yards on those four receptions, but it should have been a bigger game for him against the Eagles, who just frankly aren't that great of a defense. But this is a much better matchup even than the Eagles matchup. Chicago has given up 913 yards and six touchdowns to opposing wide receivers over their past four games alone. And that includes games against the Vikings and the Buccaneers. Not two of the best passing games. Definitely not. I mean, obviously you have, you know, good receivers on those teams. You've got Patterson who's solid. And then you've got Mike Evans and, and Vincent Jackson who both are capable of putting up good numbers. But those passing games just have not been consistent. But they even still, they put up good numbers against Chicago. So I understand the Cowboys were bad on offense last week. But they have a full week to prepare from last Thursday to this coming up Thursday. And this game, I do definitely expect Des Bryant to be a big part of the offense. He was a little bit frustrated last week, and I think that he's going to be in Tony Romo's ear. Throw me the ball, man. Throw me the ball. And I expect him to get good fantasy production this week. I would expect him to get into the end zone. And even if he doesn't, I expect, you know, seven, eight catches from him, which should be good enough to get you some good yardage. The guy that I'm going to be sitting is Josh Gordon, who I understand has been great since coming back. But he's the guy that I have to sit out of this group, given the fact that he's in the toughest matchup. The Colts are the sixth-ranked defense in fantasy points per game allowed to opposing wide receivers. They've only given up one wide receiver touchdown over their past three games. And the Browns have been really struggling on offense overall. We just don't know who their quarterback's going to be right now at this point in time. Could be Manziel. Could be Hoyer. If it's Hoyer, is he going to be kind of sh shook because he doesn't want to lose his job? And if it's if it's Manziel, are they going to have a leash on him? Are they going to only let him throw 25 times in the game? I don't know. But what I do know is that the team won't be picking a quarterback until Wednesday. And that gives and that's Wednesday at the earliest. We've heard this before. We're going to pick a quarterback on Wednesday, and then it comes practice time on Wednesday, and they're still splitting snaps. So uh, this wouldn't be the first time at all that a team has lied about that. But even if he is picked, uh, even if one of the quarterbacks is chosen on Wednesday, uh, he, they have less and less time to work with Johnny Manziel. That's, that's only going to give them two, three days to work as far as practice practice before the game. So I think that Josh Gordon is the biggest risk of this group this week. Obviously in in most formats, I'm going to have Josh Gordon in my in my lineup still. He's just a superstar talent who's getting so many targets right now, but given the fact that your other options are Des Bryant, Odell Beckham and Jordy Nelson, I am going to sit, sit Josh Gordon in your case this week. Still, though, I have Josh Gordon ranked, I think, 12th on my list right now. So that should tell you that I still have him ranked as a low-end wide receiver one this week. You're just super stacked at wide receiver, so congratulations. Good luck in your playoffs, obviously, my man. All right, so that is going to do it for today's show, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something as well. If you did, please be sure to give this video the thumbs up below. Press that like button and also click, click subscribe if you're new to the channel because that's how you're going to know when I update things and when I put out a new video, the next episode of the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast, usually up on Friday or Saturday. So if you guys have any questions about your lineup for this week's games, we're headed to the playoffs, guys. So, you know, it's now is do or die time. If you have questions, make sure that you leave those in the comments section below or, of course, you can tweet them to me at ClickWithTV. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I, I really do appreciate it. And be sure to check back later this week. I'll have a full preview of week 14. And of course, I will also be answering your questions from YouTube and Twitter. Thanks again, guys. And I'll see you guys next time here on the Fantasy Football Swagger Podcast.